In 2014, President Barack Obama appointed Bacchus as U.S. ambassador to China, a position he held until 2017. I am fairly certain uh, that you remember 1972 well because I looked at your uh, your Wikipedia page, and that's uh, the first time you were elected to as a state rep there in Montana. Uh, rather unfairly, that's not mentioned in the uh, history books of uh, key events in 1972, although I'm sure it's in yours. What is, though, is uh, Nixon's visit to China and, of course, that historic uh, move to recognize Chairman Mao, meet with Chairman Mao. Talk to me about uh, what that was like as, as a guy who had just gotten elected to office. I'm sure you were probably uh, very interested from a political standpoint about what was happening. Give me your sense of what it was like for you there in Montana. Well, first, um, it's a stunning visit, uh, President Nixon's visit to, uh, to China. Um, uh, at the time, to be honest, I was a bit focused on what I was doing in the, in the state of Montana. But I've always had a deep interest in China because my political mentor was Mike Mansfield, who is majority leader of the United States Senate. Um, he was in the Senate at the time. He's a Far East Asian history professor. And frankly, one of the most fascinating speeches I've read um, in my lifetime was by him. It was written in, I think, 1968. And it was, you know, it's an old typewriter and words crossed out in the old days before word processors. And it was basically why the United States should take a more positive view toward China. It was a long view he took. I know we spent some time with Dr. Kissinger. I know we spent some time with President Nixon. And I have a hunch that uh, Mike Mansfield had a lot to do with um, Dr. Kissinger and President Nixon deciding that uh, maybe it made sense after all to, to, uh, to go visit China and develop a relationship with China. Now, at the time, I knew Mansfield um, and, and I was watching what he was doing with China. And I knew it was important, but the, the visit itself I think was more important than people realize. Although at the time, I don't know if it's the realization sank in as much as it should. Over time, we've realized just how important that was. It's so interesting because I think uh, people growing up today, uh, you know, I have kids and, and they're in their 30s. And to them, they've never known a time when uh, there wasn't this relationship between the United States and China. But China must have been a mystery for a guy in Montana in 1972 and for a lot of your friends. Um, so can you talk about how things have changed dramatically in, in that sense? It's, um, it's stunning. Um, it's, it's filled with revelations. It's filled with irony. It's incredible. Um, back then, of course, the United States was you know, fighting communists all over the world. The Cold War was pretty cold, pretty frigid. USSR, China, all those communists worldwide. Um, and it was it was that was our focus. The world is very much bipolar. The United States and its the countries under its umbrella. And the, basically, at that point, it was the Soviet Union and the countries under its umbrella. China was important at the time, but China was not nearly as important as, a, as an economic and political power then as it is today. So it's just it, it, the economics have changed so much, but also the politics have changed so much. And it's, it's whereas President Nixon really made probably the most important uh, diplomatic visit in American history, we're now at a time when we most Americans don't realize that, don't realize the immense uh, uh, positive political significance of that trip, and don't realize just how courageous it was. You know, at the time, the U.S. was very anti-communism. It wasn't too long after McCarthyism reached its peak, but then then collapsed. But um, we were very anti-China. In fact, um. um uh, President Eisenhower picked Nixon because Nixon was so anti-China. And anti, excuse me, because Nixon was so anti-communist. He was he hated that. that. That's how he campaigned. But once he got elected, he realized that, and I think with the influence of, of Dr. Kissinger, and also because Richard Nixon was a very smart man, that there maybe it made sense um, to maybe drive a wedge between China and the, and the former Soviet Union at the same time open up trade. So it's it's just it's an amazing development, and to contrast that with today. Sure, we have immense bilateral bilateral trade between our two countries, upwards of five hundred and sixty billion dollars total two way trade, but the political um, tension is much greater today than it was back then after the Nixon visit. 
Nixon spent a week in China, visiting some of the country's greatest landmarks and interacting with Chinese residents. You know, I, I want to go there with that, but just kind of maybe just kind of dig a little deeper on the Nixon visit, because I think you said it was a courageous visit. It was also, whether you, you like uh, Nixon or not, whatever party you're in, you have to look at it as this was really a bold step. And I think about today, uh, you know, do we have the capacity to have bold steps? Uh, because now you've got a 24-hour news cycle, you've got social media, you've got the spinners and the leakers. Could something like this even happen today? And what have we lost as a result if, if it's not capable, if we're not capable of doing that? Well, you put your finger on a lot of the reasons why it's very, very difficult today um, for President Biden, for example, to undertake an action such as this. Nevertheless, I do think that if, say, President Biden or, or say, um, you know, President Xi were to undertake something approaching this, it would just undercut a lot of the, if not cynicism, a lot of the indifference is caused in the world today because of, of the internet, social media, um, and, and short-term thinking, short attention spans, and so forth, uh, I think. And besides that, you know, something like that, I think it's worth trying. Don't forget back then, this was, as you say, is a very bold move by President Nixon. Now, he didn't just decide one day to get hop on a plane and go to, to Guam and then to Shanghai and, and to Beijing. No, this was uh, thought through. And Dr. Kissinger had several secret trips to talk to uh, Premier Joe and Lai. When they thought through all the steps and all that was needed to be attended to before finally deciding and announcing to the world, a uh, historic announcement, surprising announcement by President Nixon that he's gonna go. Months prior to his 1979 trip to the US, Deng Xiaoping had announced China's new reform in opening up policy. China would now welcome foreign trade and investment. Nixon's 1972 trip to China signaled the beginnings of normalized relations, and Dong's visit fully realized those diplomatic ties. You served as ambassador to China uh, during the Obama administration, and at the time, the vice president is our current uh, president here in the United States. I, I want to get your thoughts on, on some of the things that stand out for you, the people. What, what are some of the things that will always be with you about your time in China? Oh, I loved it. I, I, I feel like I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world. I had two terrific jobs. One, representing Montana, the United States Senate, chairman of the Finance Committee for seven years. Loved it. Second, loved just as much of representing the United States I mean, um, and China. I loved it for two reasons. One, the people. I, the people I found so energetic, upbeat, positive, can do, want to get stuff done, um, somewhat challenged um, and competitive. I think based partly upon the, you know, the great leap forward rem memories and the cultural revolution memories, but just very upbeat and positive but, and, and want to get deals done. Second reason I loved it so much is just working on the relationship, U.S.-China. Uh, read Dr. Kissinger's book on China before going over, and that was kind of my Bible. And I just spent the time to try to I talk to the Chinese people, especially the government and, and private sectors. Hey, we got to get along better together. You know, that was the question that people talk still today about so-called Thucydides trap. And so I asked that question, is there a trap or not? I asked it so often <laughs> in a summit between President Xi and, and President Obama, right away, President Xi said, oh no, he volunteered. There's no Thucydides trap here. And I know it's because I was asking it so much. And same thing, a later summit with, with, with the President Obama, he said, oh no, no, there's no trap. But of course that is a question. Whenever they gave that answer, I thought, I don't know. The jury's out, depends on us. Are we gonna do what needs to be done so there is no trap or are we gonna not do what needs to be done so there might be a trap? For those who aren't familiar with the trap, outline it and where are we in terms of the trap? Well, there's a, a, a story in Greek historian Thucydides um, wrote about uh, rising powers and established powers. And um, it's, it's been popularized by various academics ever since the point being, that often an established power, in this case, Athens and Sparta, um, I've forgotten which is, I think Athens was, was established power, and Sparta rising. And so there's almost always conflict because the established power doesn't know how to deal with the rising, and the rising wants to be the 
something close to the established. And throughout history, um, you know, that clash has occurred several times and usually it hasn't turned out too well. Usually there's some kind of actual conflict. So it's very important for us as much as possible as the two largest economies in the world to do what we can to make sure that that tension, and it's inevitable because China is rising so much and, it, and because the United States still is the largest economy in the world, it's inevitable that there be tension. It's inevitable. And uh, we just have to manage that better. In December 2021, the Biden administration announced that it would not send any diplomatic or official representatives to the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics, citing human rights concerns. China Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijong said China would take, quote, resolute countermeasures arguing against politicizing sports. A lot of Sino-U.S. watchers kind of felt like when Biden was elected, he would tilt more towards your old boss, Obama, and have more of that sensible policy towards China. And yet a lot of people feel like he's kind of adapted to the Trump policies and really hasn't shifted that much. Are you surprised at that? Is he just boxed in within Washington? How do you see it? I was a bit surprised, frankly. Um, and I think the Chinese were surprised. I have many Chinese friends who would tell me, gee, I hope... Uh, Joe Biden gets elected, and I go back to why. He said, well, if Biden's elected, you know, that strengthens the hands of the reformers, not the hawks, but the reformers. And maybe we can deal better with the United States if Biden wins. Well, it hasn't turned out that way. Um, uh, uh, Joe Biden, President Biden, is virtually as hawkish as uh, President Trump, maybe even more so in some respects. And I think, frankly, it's due almost entirely to domestic politics. Um, Republicans and Democrats, and together in the Congress, Washington, D.C., nearly unified, anti-China, anti-China. It's, it's, very, it's very unfortunate, driven, obviously, by um, elective politics in America, 22, in 2022 congressional elections coming up in the presidential 2024. And nobody wants to be perceived as running for office, perceived as, quote, soft on China. It's, it's unfortunate. But that's where we are. And I think it's it's a, it's a reflection of, of some of the tensions that arise of, during the, the concept of a potential Thucydides trap, because it's just, it's just those rising and established power. But you recognize from your time there, and even prior to that, uh, how this relationship, uh, there are tensions, clearly, uh, but there are benefits as well. And it seems like everyone kind of cast aside the benefits. And it seems like this carousel you're talking about, it's not every four years, it's every two years. How do you get off the carousel? How do you change the dynamic? How do you change the conversation? I, I think that um, it's gonna take a little while. I, I think it'll start, the conversation will start to change and be a little more constructive and positive of when um, both countries realize, I'm speaking now, especially in the United States, that, hey, we've got to get along with each other. China's not going anywhere. The United States isn't going anywhere. That is, we're all, we're all we're going to be here. So we got to figure out how we deal with each other. And um, it's, it's and name calling doesn't work. Name calling makes things worse. When the country criticizes, we, we, we criticize China, they, us and so forth. We, it's, it's when we realize we have to find a way to deal with each other. Because after all, what, what leaders really care about is the well-being of their people. You know, people, Chinese people, American people, they really want the same thing. What's that? They want to have food on the table, decent jobs, take care of their kids, decent, decent education for their kids, air and water pollution addressed, you know, decent health care, let alone a little bit, pursue their dreams. I mean, it's not a lot, it's, it's pretty similar, actually. And when we realize that the cultural differences should not get in the way of us trying to work things out. Now, Americans will always espouse uh, the, the, uh, human rights, human values. It's important, but have to recognize that it, it's the, human rights are treated a little bit differently in, in, in different countries. And we, need, we shouldn't just jam American views down the throats of, in this case, China. We should work with other country, express our points of view, but we can't personalize our views and, and be, and be, uh, and, and be critical of China or, or come across as arrogant or, or condescending uh, toward China, just as China cannot toward us. 
Uh, I'm sure you remember the Sunnyland Summit in Southern California, President Obama, President Xi meeting. Uh, oh. we, we all remember the Mar-a-Lago Summit where uh, President Xi went to the Mar-a-Lago oh. estates. Uh, there's, Im- there's something quite important about two leaders coming together, as you well recognize. That hasn't happened, uh, obviously, the coronavirus pandemic uh, hindering things. Uh, Biden and she have, have met virtually, but they haven't met in person. How important do you think that meeting is going to be? And when do you think it might happen? It's critical. It's critical they meet together personally. We all know that even though we're speaking here <laughs> virtually, it'd be even better if we were here personally. Um, I'm, I'm afraid it might take a little while because of the, of, of the coronavirus. I'm just because of COVID. China communication. Uh, before Nixon went to China for the preceding about 25 or so years, you know, China just shut off from America. And then finally, with the Nixon trip, and then after the opening up with Deng Xiaoping, things started to get, get we made a little progress, things started to develop. But at, to be honest, um, uh, during the um, Trump era, that was shut off pretty directly, the communication between our two countries, at least at a high level. And that was pre-COVID, but now that COVID said it, it's going to take time. I just think we should work, we should try to lay the foundation as much as possible for a person-to-person trip. And let's hope that it happens sooner rather than later. The uh, agreement uh, between Obama and Xi, you know, that that really became the cornerstone for the Paris Agreement. We just saw John Kerry as well uh, and China coming together again. Uh, climate is an area, you know, is it one of those areas where the two countries can come together and actually build out? I mean, you were talking about global health. There should be areas where there should be cooperation and the growth of a relationship. Are, are those the key areas, you think? So far, they are. <clears throat> and they're the ones that people talk about. <clears throat> when I was serving, I would mention to President Xi and to others the importance of addressing climate change <laughs> It's like talking to a fence post. I got no reaction, zero, zip, not a, nothing. But after a while, a little glimmer of interest, and I'm not the only one who would present the question to the Chinese government, but also as cabinet secretaries that come over, I think President Obama may have mentioned it as well. But China saw a real opportunity. And that's I, this is one of the reasons I, I am, I'm, I'm pretty <clears throat> bullish on China. It's they, They're positive, they're forward-looking. The opportunity was that President Xi could be on the world stage with, with the American president. President Xi could represent the developing countries and President Obama, the developed countries. They're all on world stage together. And that was pretty, that was, was a good for the uh, stature of Chinese from their perspective. Second, uh, he was able, President Xi and the government, to push back against the non reformers generally, the troglodytes, the ones that just want to keep things the way they are. And he's saying, no, no, we got to make some changes here because look what the United States is doing, look at the opportunity we have. And even more important from China's perspective, China saw the opportunity to develop renewable technologies and sell around the world, solar, wind, and you name it. And man, they did that with a vengeance. And so I, I just think there are opportunities, huge opportunities, but somehow we've just got to get past the quote, anti-China rhetoric and it's, it's, it's going to take some time for that to happen. Ambassador uh, Richard Nixon had his flaws. We all know that. Uh, this unexpected visit to China in 72, though, of course, uh, was huge. And he even said at a banquet in his honor, this was the week that changed the world. What's your hope for the next 50 years? <laughs> well, I, I hope I'm around. <laughs> <laughs> we do, too. <laughs> um, it is, there's no question that the and I've said this a hundred times, that the, that the well-being of, of, of American citizens and the well-being of Chinese citizens, indeed, of the world, depends greatly on how well the United States and China manage this relationship. And if, if we manage it well, then the standard of living of our kids and grandkids is writ large are going to be a lot better than if we don't handle it well. So my hope 50 years from now, looking back, hey, Nixon went to China 50 years ago, maybe 50 years from now, um, there'll be some major event that occurred maybe during the next couple of three years. So that 50 years from now, we look back and say, hey, you know, there was a little hiatus for a while, but, you know, somebody saw the lights, you know, some people kind of realized, hey, the wise thing to do is it's going to figure this thing out. And it started to happen. Ambassador, it was a delight. Thanks so much for your time. 
You bet. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.